just in terms of an interesting finding, if you take people with long COVID and you take people with ME-CFS, um, you find a couple of symptoms that are actually different. Right. Um, for example, unrefreshing sleep um, is something that occurs in the ME-CFS samples. Um, we don't see it as much in the long COVID. And hot and cold feelings in temperature variations, um, flu-like symptoms, those are ME-CFS symptoms, not long COVID symptoms. It's really interesting. And I have a colleague who's in the audience, Judith Richmond, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and we began talking in the early 1990s, and we said, what can we do? How can we make a difference? And we realized very early on that if this illness was something that affected very few people, um, and as you mentioned, probably close to 20,000, it wasn't gonna get the attention or the resources that was needed. And the reason it seemed unlikely that those numbers were correct was because the CDC at the time was getting four to 5,000 phone calls a month from people who were complaining of some of the symptoms. Also, the Seafoods Association at that time had a membership that was almost that size. So the question is, was there something wrong with that research? We thought there was. And if you really think about it, they had different cities basically nominate individuals who might have this illness. But the problem is, if you had physicians who didn't believe the illness existed, and if you had patients who weren't in healthcare, you were gonna underrepresent the counts. And that's the problem with the way that they were doing prevalence research at the CDC. Well, we put a grant proposal in, and my colleague, Judy Richmond, who's in the audience, um, when we got the results, it basically said, the CDC has already determined that this is a relatively rare disorder. Why do you want to do this community prevalence study that doesn't use physicians as gatekeepers? So Judith looked at me and she said, we'll never get this fund. There's too much bias. So it was very apparent to me that we needed to get some pilot data to basically indicate that the truth might be different from what was out there. And that's when I approached the Seafoods Association, now South, and basically they graciously gave us money so that we could hire some individuals to make phone calls, to do medical assessments um, at Mercy Hospital at the time. Um, and we basically did a pilot, which we ultimately um, used to get a grant funded that allowed us to do a community-based prevalence study where we basically didn't have physicians as gatekeepers to send us, but we basically randomly contacted people, thousands of people in the community. And those people in the community that we thought had some of the symptoms of this illness were brought in for a complete medical and psychiatric examination. That particular study, from beginning to end, took almost 10 years of basic work to get the funding, to do the research, to get the, the findings distributed. And once that occurred, what was most interesting is that the CDC at the time basically said, this is the way we need to do research using community-based samples. And that's what shifted some of their own research to doing that. I might add that um, over another long period of time, we shifted from an adult focus to pediatric focus, and we also basically looked at the prevalence of ME-CFS in youth. And my colleague here, Ben Katz at Lurie Children's Hospital, was primarily responsible for basically that pediatric section of the grant. So we thank Ben for his work on that project. So yes, um, it was very important to break the myth that, very interesting, we found in that first study in the 1990s that individuals who were actually African American, individuals who were of different ethnicities, actually had prevalence rates that were as high or higher than in the white population because we were sampling from the whole distribution of the Chicagoland metropolitan area. We also found most interesting that not just um, 
a very few people had this illness, but it was actually um, a pretty prevalent illness. Um, and those particular statistics have now been used um, for many years. So yes, that was our gateway in, and I thank Saab and me, um, the old CFITS Association, for that pilot money, because truthfully, getting pilot funds is not easy. And sometimes if it's judiciously applied, it can have a tremendous effect. We estimated that about 0.42% of the population had this illness. That tr translates roughly to about 835,000 people. And certainly this was back in the mid-1990s. Um, so the rates have changed since then. In about 20, 2009, 2010, um, we decided that it was important to standardize how one asked the questions of the symptoms of patients. So if everybody uses a different way of asking a particular question, um, post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, or these different questions, all the patients will be asked it slightly differently. And if everyone is asking the questions differently, then it's impossible to have reliability across settings. And if you have people being selected for studies that have different symptoms because the instruments are selecting different types of people, then you have what's called problems with the criterion. Um, so the case definition needs to be there to develop focused symptoms, the way you ask the questions and thresholds for determining whether a symptom is basically severe enough to make a burden, so it should be counted. Those are all pieces of the scientific puzzle. We focused a period of time developing what's called the DePaul symptom questionnaire. That particular questionnaire allowed us to ask a set of questions and then basically de determine whether a person met different case definitions. Now what's very interesting about the first study that we did with the DePaul symptom questionnaire was we gave the questionnaire to healthy normal individuals who don't have problems, and then we gave them two samples of people with ME-CFS. And what we found was with patients with ME-CFS, they could make differentiations in the symptoms in, in statistical terms of factor analysis, unique factors emerged. They were distinct, but with people who were healthy, you've got one general factor. So it clearly was different. So think about the Eskimos. The Eskimos, when they look at snow, can see many different variations of it because they're attuned to it. The same thing with this illness. If you just think about <coughs> unwellness, which some people think of, it's a very amorphous topic. And a lot of people do feel unwell at times, particularly when they have the flu or something like that. But ME-CFS is a very distinct state. And that's what the DePaul symptom questionnaire is trying to determine. Now, one of the things that we did very early on was with Solv and me, was trying to collect data across the country. And there were basically a trial occurring where some of the leading centers around the United States um, that see patients with ME-CFS um, were able to use this new instrument to collect data um, across the country and that particular initiative um, was um, the biobank. And the biobank was basically something that SAUVME was behind in terms of funding. And the data that we were able to use was the direct product of SAUVME setting up this large network and basically providing us access to this data that we could then do basic research on. This thing called Recover, and it really is a national set of hubs around the United States that are collecting data, both adults and pediatric samples, and collecting data over time from people who have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, some of whom continue to have symptoms, some of whom don't, some of them have long COVID. There are thousands of researchers around the country who are connected with this effort. It's huge. Matter of fact, this morning, I was emailing some people 
that are dealing with recover using the symptom questionnaire focusing on post-exertional malaise, um, which again, you know, has been an important signal for patients with ME-CFS, but very few people have really thought of it as a serious symptom, so they haven't developed instruments to measure it. So, but our group has been doing that for a long time. So they're very interested at Recover and um, these different institutes, the use of our questionnaires. The problem has been that they don't have an MECFS sample, a pure MECFS sample to compare to these thousands and thousands of people that are being recruited over time, both with adults and pediatrics. So to the extent that we could get a sample with MECFS, we could then compare them to those who are going through this testing over time for people who've been exposed to SARS-CoV-2. We have gotten approval from Recover to basically launch a study. Um, if we have funding, we can do it, um, but that's what we're waiting for. We do have some funds to basically look at individuals who have had um, SARS-CoV-2 not recovered. The big difference is that sample doesn't have the same measures that Recover has. So Recover has a protocol that right, has right, basically right. been developed. Our protocol has basically been developed by us. Right. Um, Recover basically has a completely different one. Nice. If you look at samples for MECFS, they tend to be small. And if you have a small sample, it's very hard to get subgroups. So if you really want to do good subgroup research, you've got to have large samples. Um, and I think we can all recognize that there's some people who basically have unique situations and symptoms. So for example, there's some people who have what's called orthostatic intolerance. Um, they stand up, they feel faint, um, or it's hard to kind of keep their balance because they're probably not getting enough um, you know, blood to the brain. Not everyone has that. There's people who have all types of kind of immune issues, um, maybe early on, and then some very few. Um, pain versus not pain. You can kind of go over and over the different types of situations. Certainly there are different precipitating, predisposing factors, and there's probably different factors um, that have subtype differences, important ones. So in medicine, think about kind of, we once thought of cancer affecting the lung. Oh, you have lung cancer, as an example. Today, that's a very antiquated notion. There are multiple types of lung cancer. They have to be diagnosed differently and have to be treated differently. Why wouldn't MECFS be the same? So there are different systems that are abnormal. Um, some individuals have a gastrointestinal, some a cerebral, some kind of different systems. Sometimes these systems have to be treated differently. Um, so absolutely. Um, subtypes is probably the name of the game. Um, and um, yeah, we, we feel very strongly. Um, matter of fact, uh, some of the recent research that we're doing at our center is trying to split people into subtypes. Michelle here is looking at cognitive impairment. Do you want to say anything about cognitive impairment and what have we learned about, or what are we trying to do with that? In fact, I was just talking the complexity of uh, post-exertional malaise. You know, you kind of think that that's something easy to monitor because they're talking about kind of what's called the CPAP cardiopulmonary exercise test um, and to giving that to kids who are in this recovery trial. Um, so they've asked me to join a working group to basically try to think about what are the issues with trying to assess whether a person might have PEM. And is PEM going to be post-exertional malaise a problem for some of these youth? Um, how do we think about clearance? But, but think about how hard it is to assess something like post-exertional malaise. A person might be doing pacing, so they're kind of controlling post-exertional malaise. They don't experience it that much. And then you put them on 
like a treadmill or a bicycle or you push them and they might have a very exacerbated kind of symptomatology because they're not used to it. So unless you ask the questions right, do you experience PEM? Which is when you kind of push a person a little bit with activity, they have a massive onset of symptoms that not just immediately after, but sometimes days, weeks, and months after. So if you do a test, which they're considering doing, are you going to assess after, not just then, as to what are the consequences? Very interesting symptom from a scientific point of view to assess, but you gotta do it correctly. So the first grant went in and, and as we said, the reviewer said, there's no reason to fund this because we already know it's a rare disease and you're never gonna find anyone if you do a community-based study and you try to randomly survey 30,000 people, you won't find anyone. So we disagreed, we got funding from the organization. We, our pilot suggested we would find people. Um, we sent that grant in. When that grant got reviewed, there was no epidemiologist on it. Um, and we challenged the review. They said, how can you basically do a review of a grant that doesn't have the expertise on it? Well, NIH said, well, you can't challenge a grant. And you said, well, watch us. Um, we did challenge it. Um, and we caused some trouble and we kind of, but eventually we were able to resubmit the grant, um, taking the advice um, of you know, everybody and we basically had a top notch. They put the toughest epidemiologist they could find on the review committee mm -hmm. when our next grant went in and we got probably about the best score you can get is like a 1%. So we have a study that is just about ready to come out that indicates if you have ME-CFS, you're more likely to have family members with it. But here's the interesting thing. Gastrointestinal problems tend to be more common. So that's a unique finding that just coming out. I have been approached by some big pharma companies um, who have um, asked to use some of my questionnaires, for example, um, and wanted me to sign exclusive kind of commitments with them as well as to consult with them. Um, and I've declined to do them all because whatever we produce at the poll, we want to make it free. We want to make it accessible. We want anyone to be able to use it. And we want to be able to not keep secrets. We want to basically disseminate everything. So that just has to do with some of our instruments that we've created and some of the interesting conversations I've had with some very large um, pharma companies. But in terms of funding, um, yeah, I mean, there's a real need to find alternative sources. Um, so that's something that we need. And um, But really, the people who know more about that are um, advocacy organizations.